Thank you for the invitation to give this talk on COVID and ITP. Um, Mike Macris, I'm a consultant hematologist in Sheffield. On this slide shows my disclosures that relate around another part of my job where I'm running an adverse event reporting scheme for hemophilia in Europe. But in reality, there is nothing really that for me to disclose in relation to this specific presentation I'm going to give today. When we are talking about COVID, it's a bit of a simplification. The World Health Organization defined the names to use and the name of the disease is COVID-19 and the virus that causes the disease is called SARS-CoV-2. But really for this presentation that I'm going to give today, what I'm planning to do is to just use the term COVID to cover both the disease and also the virus that causes the disease. The other aspect that I need to define is that I am going to be talking largely about primary ITP. And by that I mean the disease without uh, another cause for it. For this is a publication from 2009 and analyzing their data, very large experience there. And 20% of the patients had secondary ITP and 80% had primary ITP. The secondary causes are listed on the right. Uh, the abbreviations are shown on the diagram and I've put the actual names in the table in the list on the right hand side. As you can see, is mostly autoimmune diseases and it's not surprising because if you have one autoimmune disease, you're more likely to have another one such as ITP. The final point I wanted to make on this slide is the penultimate cause of the secondary causes there, and that it says post-vaccine 1%. And if you remember, this uh, publication was in 2009. And as you may be aware, ITP can follow any vaccination, including flu or meningococcal vaccination. And it was always been there and just at a low level. And the issue of whether and how much does it occur after COVID vaccination, I am not going to tackle to any degree because um, this is going to be tackled in the next presentation you're going to hear from Quentin Hill. It is going to be helpful if, we, if I review with you the data on what has happened over the last two years regarding COVID. If we start from the bottom, um, a new infection, a new respiratory infection started appearing in China in November 2019. And by the very start of 2020, the World Health Organization recognized this disease and called it COVID-19. Um, one important aspect that the Chinese are not getting um, credit for is that they published the genomic sequence of the virus and that allows everybody else to, to uh, develop the PCR test. The next thing that happened was a rather delayed first lockdown in the UK at the end of March and a further lockdown in the autumn and the third lockdown after Christmas uh, 2020. The big and central point that I wish to stress is the impact of vaccination and that happened around the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. 
And as you can see on the right hand side, all restrictions were removed at the start of April 2022. The other thing that happened was that we had the variants being named, given Greek letters. The ones early on, they were not named and it proved very difficult to follow them because they were given their uh, position of the mutations and there were a lot of them. So we had the alpha variant, which was the Kent variant, if you remember. The beta variant happened in starting in South Africa the gamma variant in Brazil. We all remember the pictures of the Delta variant in India and the impact. And then the Omicron is what is with us at the moment. So where did COVID-19 come from? Well, as you all know, it came from uh, Wuhan in China. And I've got some two pictures here. One of them is the Institute of Virology uh, that a lot of the research uh, was being done on these viruses and on the right hand uh, side is where the animal vector that is believed to have come from. This is the horseshoe bat and the, these bats are known to carry a virus called RATG13 and this virus is 96% identical to SARS-CoV-2 which causes COVID. So it's highly likely that this is a very close relative, if not a very almost identical virus. So on this map, you can see the map of China and where Wuhan is. It's just basically west of Shanghai, where the red dot there is. And when uh, we first learned about it, we knew that the Wuhan Institute of Virology is where most of the research on these SARS viruses was happening and lots of conspiracy theories started at the time and the point was well isn't it a coincidence here you have these virology institute where most of the research on these viruses happens and the pandemic starts in the city where that virology institute um, is um, located. Actually, um, the reality may not be uh, due to a conspiracy like that, but may relate why is that institute there. The institute is there and they're doing the research there because south of Wuhan there is some caves where loads of bad populations live and that's why they've been concentrating their research on the bats. The second coincidence happens because Wuhan has a wet market and a wet market is where you sell live animals and especially live wild animals and the third coincidence is where the population eats wild animal meat so I suspect personally that it's not really an escape from the virology institute but rather than the combination as shown in number two there Turning to thrombostopenia during COVID, thrombostopenia being the reduced platelet account. A, a, a reduced platelet account is quite common during COVID, but it's very, very, only very mild. Having a platelet account below 100 is less than 1 in 20 patients. Uh, you may recall that the normal platelet account is 150 to 400. We also learned that the severity of the low platelet account correlates with the severity of COVID. But you get very few COVID patients who have platelet accounts as low as below 20. That quite often is what you get with ITP. And I think it's unlikely that we would have confused ITP with COVID thrombostopenia, even when we didn't know much about their condition. Some other points about COVID and ITP. The ITP patients were not more likely to get infection with COVID. And COVID infection in ITP patients was not more likely to be severe unless the patients were severely immunocompromised due to 
very high doses of steroids or due to having secondary ITP. And we basically developed the very strong impression and advice that all ITP patients should be offered vaccination against COVID. Some practicalities you've all have probably experienced. If the playlist handles below 20, people taking nasal swabs should be very careful to avoid nosebleeds uh, in the person having the, uh, the test. Also, if the playlist handles below 20, when you're having your vaccination, you should press on the side for about five minutes to avoid a hematoma. We started reconsidering whether all the appointments we used to give were necessary and we limited the appointments. And if patients were hospitalized, um, they required anticoagulation and um, uh, that depended on the play account. In terms of treatment, this was very similar to what we've traditionally used. However, if patients were COVID negative, we used thrombopoietin receptor agonists early to avoid giving steroids and immunosuppression to the patients. So this was a change because the standard first-line therapy for new or relapsed ITP in the UK is still largely steroids. But during the COVID pandemic, TPO receptor agonists were used. For patients who are positive for COVID, we used intravenous immunoglobulin and if patients who are very sick and were ventilated or required high doses of oxygen, we used steroids. Many of you listening to this were probably placed in this category of clinically extremely vulnerable patients. And there was a very strict definition for this. Basically, if you had steroids of more than 20 milligrams of prenicillone daily for more than four weeks, or five milligrams of prenicillone plus another immunosuppressive agent, or you had rituximab in the last 12 months. Another reason was two immunosuppressive agents um, in the last year plus a comorbidity, or patients who had a splenectomy and a, another immunosuppressive agent. And as you recall, these individuals in this group were advised to um, isolate and avoid infection as much as possible. In terms of delivery of care uh, for ITP during COVID, uh, we used off-site blood testing, and I'll tell to you in the next two slides about that. We had appointments largely by telephone or video, and in our centre in Sheffield, less than 10% of the patients were seen in person. And in terms of delivery of medication, at least in Sheffield, we used ele electronic prescriptions, no paper, and um, patients were able to collect the prescription from the nearest boots, the chemist. And the reason I point out that this is in Sheffield is because in Sheffield, boots has um, pharmacists within the hospital and that's where they collect the outpatient prescriptions. So they could collect it from any boots, not just the ones in the hospital. We could post the medications, and when it was urgent, we could send them by taxi or uh, using volunteers to deliver them. And all of this was done by the chemists, not by us uh, in the clinical setting. This is the best thing that I think happened during the pandemic and this is the phlebotomy service. It started because the Sheffield Arena is where you have lots of concerts and they had a massive car park. And the hospital built up this tented city essentially where patients could drive up to have their blood tests without coming anywhere near the hospital. So we would tell the patient, uh, we would complete the request in the hospital system. The patients did not require anything, turn up, put their arm out of the window and uh, have the blood test and then drive home. And we would get the result in about two or three hours. For urgent results, they had these um, white knight volunteers on bikes. They would pick up the sample, bring it to the hospital. And really from the patients, they drive up, have their blood test. And the sample is actually 
brought by these riders in the hospital who have the result before the patient reaches their home having given the blood test. This service has continued and is available still now uh, in a different location. It's close to the M1 motorway on the approach to the city. Patients do not require any forms. There are no appointments and they do not leave their, their car. They stick their car out of the window. It's open 8 a.m. to 5.20 p.m. Actually, I made a mistake there. It should be Monday to Friday, not just Thursday. It's Monday to Friday. And on Saturday morning is 8 to 1 p.m. So this is an amazing service and I hope it continues um, as we move forward. <clears throat> In the last part of my lecture, I'd like to talk to you about what happened over the last um, year and a bit since 1st of January 2021 when the vaccination started. So during this period obviously we continue to get the typical ITP completely unrelated to Covid and completely unrelated to vaccination. But the whole population of the UK were offered vaccination on the 1st of January and um, we started seeing patients with low player accounts and the commonest type is ITP, and again, as I mentioned, Quentin Hill will address this in the next lecture. But we saw something very unusual called VIT, and I'll talk about it shortly. I'll start by giving you an example. This is an 18-year-old girl admitted to one of the hospitals near Sheffield. It was not admitted under our care. Um, she was previously healthy, she was on no medication, she was a healthcare worker, so she was able to get vaccination early. 11 days prior to her admission, she had the AstraZeneca vaccine and her play count was 10. She was COVID negative, she had a head CT scan and it was normal. So headache with purpura, you was thought to be, could it be migraine and uh, purpura, play count of 10, you thought that this was ITP, very reasonable. So she was admitted, she started on steroids. But three days later, the headache got worse, and this was two weeks after the vaccination. She had another head CT scan, and this time it showed cerebral vein thrombosis, which is extremely rare to see thrombosis at presentation of ITP. Sometimes in ITP we can see thrombosis, but it's not at presentation. This is usually after starting uh, treatment. So she was started on intravenous immunoglobulin and within 24 hours she died. So the cause of death was thought to be cerebral vein thrombosis with ITP, something we've never seen before. A month after this girl died, a new syndrome was recognized in the UK, in Germany and in Norway. And it, there was press conferences uh, reporting this. And this is called vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. It's basically uh, five to 30 days after AstraZeneca vaccination with low platelets, with thrombosis, high levels of D-dimer, that's a blood test, and antibodies to platelet factor four. So here you see comparison of ITP and VIT. They both have low platelets. They're both after vaccination, but VIT is only after the AstraZeneca vaccine. Timing is very similar. Thrombosis, you only get it with VIT. And there is a way to tell the difference with D-dimer. But because if you're only thinking that the patient has ITP, you never do a D-dimer test. And there is also a specific test. The treatment is completely different. You try and improve the platelets with ITP, but with VIT, the main treatment is to give anticoagulants and to be able to do that you have to improve the platelet count first. So what was the problem we had in March and April? Thrombocytopenia was being labelled as ITP. Thrombosis was not always obvious. The headache was often migraine type and that's what it was being diagnosed as. And headache after vaccination, if you remember, is very common and half a million people were being vaccinated a day. D-dimers were not being performed in ITP because it's a marker of thrombosis. However, it's available in every hospital. 
and the anti plaque factor 4 is only available in 14 hospitals in the UK. So what did we do? We set up a daily multidisciplinary team meeting starting three days after reporting of the condition. There was a live guideline, guideline that was changing every few days. We inform all healthcare professionals. We got all the medical royal colleges to work together. And the big change happened on the 7th of April that one of the 5 p.m. national conferences on TV, uh, uh, Jenny Harris announced this syndrome and told people, if you get a severe headache and you have AstraZeneca vaccine, go to A&E. And we persuaded the health of the UK authorities to stop using the vaccine in the young people. So the A&E departments were inundated with people, but basically if you presented with a headache, the first thing you did it was to get a platelet count. We didn't want to miss any cases. And why did not want to miss any cases? Well, this is the slide you saw before, partially, but what I've put on there is the mortality. ITP, less than 1% chance of dying, but with VIT, overall, it was 20%. But initially, with VIT, mortality was 50%. One of the advantages that happened after um, we started was because patients who are presenting to any early, we picked up this group of patients called pre-VIT, which were basically the VIT patients before they developed the thrombosis. And we treated these very aggressively with immunoglobulin and anticoagulants, and the mortality was less than 1%. And we saved a, a lot of people from major harm by diagnosing at that time. This slide shows the VIT UK cases. And as you can see, around March and April, we had up to 40 cases a week in the UK of this condition that is incredibly rare and none of us has seen before. And this slide shows the number of patients and their age. In blue is the alive ones, in red are the dead ones. And as you can see on part B, it occurred, people were developing it very quickly after vaccination and their platelet counts were low. So in summary, COVID has had a major impact in every aspect of our lives. The initial way ITP is treated during the COVID time has altered with the earlier introduction of the TPO receptor agonists. The morning monitoring of patients has changed and telemedicine, I think, is here to stay. Vaccination provided a huge benefit, but also problems, some of which we've never seen before. Thank you for your attention.